Very excited to be here with you. Uh, please allow me to introduce myself. So, Yate, Mark Charles Yenishia, Simbake Dinet and Nishlin, the Pohidalin Bashish Chin, Simbake Dinet Ashish Chayla, the Chidi Nashinala. In our Navajo culture, when we introduce ourselves, we always give our four clients. We're made for lineals of people and our identities. Sorry about that. My mic was probably turned off. Let me start over again. Yat my relatives, it's very good to be with you. Today is Indigenous Peoples Day 2020, and I am excited to be able to speak to you today regarding the doctrine of discovery. Please allow me to introduce myself. So, Yat E, Mark Charles Yenishia, Sinbake Dinat Nishlin, Dr. Huglin Yashis Ching, Sinbake Dinat Dasha Che, Dr. Chit Nidashi Nala. In our Navajo culture, when we introduce ourselves, we always give our four clans. We're made for lineals of people, and our identities come from our mother's mother. Now, my mother's mother is American of Dutch heritage, and that's why I say Sinbake Dene. Loosely translated, that means I'm from the Wooden Shoe people. My second clan, my father's mother, is Toihiglini, which is the waters that flow together. My third clan, my mother's father, is also Sinbake Dene. And then my fourth clan, my father's father, is Tobichitni, and that's the Bitterwater clan. It's one of the original clans of our Navajo people. I also want to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from uh, what is now Washington, D.C., and these are the lands of the Piscataway. And I want to acknowledge that the Piscataway are still here. They are the nation that they lived here, they hunted here, they farmed here, they fished here, they raised their families here, they buried their dead here. They were here long before Columbus got lost at sea. And they're still here. And I want to acknowledge their presence. I want to acknowledge them as the host people of these lands. And I want to thank them for their stewardship of these lands for these hundreds, even thousands of years. For the past several years, even into a few decades, there has been a growing debate about what do we do with the holiday that many places around the country, even today, still call Columbus Day. Um, Columbus was a very uh, destructive historical figure who was armed with the doctrine of discovery and claimed to have discovered lands that were already inhabited. Now, if you think about that, you cannot discover lands already inhabited. You can steal those lands, you can conquer them, you can, you can colonize them, you can't discover them. And especially within the native community, there's been a growing discontent with uh, Columbus Day and uh, there has been a move to change Columbus Day into Indigenous Peoples Day day to actually honor the indigenous peoples of Pearl Island. I fully am in support of that, and I think that is something we need to do. We need to stop honoring people who commit genocide and dehumanize, and we need to begin to hold up the people who are indigenous to these lands. Um, however, I also feel very strongly that we, while we need to stop celebrating and honoring Christopher Columbus, we cannot forget what he did, and we cannot forget the significant historical impact that he had, both on the church and on the nation. And so this is why, when I announced my campaign 17, 18 months ago, we framed it as an 18-month dialogue, an 18-month journey to understand American history, and especially the doctrine of discovery. And... So today, as we go into Columbus Day 2020, I want to talk about what does it mean, uh, what does it mean to look at the history based on the Doctrine of Discovery. Now, I've been studying the Doctrine of Discovery for almost a decade, um, maybe even longer than that. I've been reached, uh, writing about it, blogging about it. I have videos up about it. And I even published a book on it titled Unselling Truth, The Ongoing Dehumanizing Legacy of the Doctrine of Discovery. Um, and I want to take some time today to, I, I have a, it's almost a three hour lecture that I've given all around the country. I've shortened it down to 20 minutes some places. I've gone along on for two, two, three, two to three days at the conference before. Uh, there's a lot of content. And I decided that for Columbus Day 20, or for Indigenous Peoples Day 2020, I wanted to give a version of this lecture, but I wanted to break it up. 
So I divided my lecture up into four parts, uh, and we're going to uh, have this lecture every two hours throughout the day. So the first section, which I'm going to do right now, is starting back in the history of the church. Now, many people will say, well, this is a running for uh, the presence of the United States. Why are you only talking about the church? Well, the United States likes to say that there is a separation of church and state. But that's actually not true. And while I am adamant, I may be a Christian, but I am not the Christian candidate. I am not running to make my nation Christian. But I also, as I've given this lecture all around the country, I've told people, both, both Christian and non-Christian, secular, uh, very public audiences, even, even uh, believers in other faiths, I've said, if you don't understand the history of the Western European Christian church, you will never understand the history of the United States. The two are so interlocked and interwoven, it's actually disgusting. And so we need to, if we want, as American citizens, if we want to figure out how do we move forward in a better way, we have to look at the way that our, our policies, our priorities, our understandings, even our worldview got skewed by Western European Christianity. We have to understand the history of the church. And this first lecture, the first 20 minutes, I'm gonna, 20 to 30 minutes, I'm gonna speak this morning, maybe even 45, we'll see how long it goes, is gonna be about the history of the church, going back to the teachings of Jesus and all the way up to the writing of the Doctrine of Discovery. The second lecture at noon today, we'll be looking at the Doctrine of Discovery and the way it's been embedded into our foundations and demonstrated throughout our history. How has this dehumanizing doctrine impacted our foundations and the history of our nation? The third lecture, which will be at two o'clock this afternoon, Eastern time, will be looking at the mythological legacy of Abraham Lincoln. He is considered by both parties to be one of our greatest presidents. And yet he has an incredibly troubling legacy. And much of what we know about him is not even true, it's mythological. And so we're gonna spend 45 minutes deconstructing the mythological legacy of Abraham Lincoln this afternoon. And then at four o'clock, we're going to take all that history and we're gonna look at trauma and gain a better understanding of how trauma has impacted the way our nation dealt with this, not only in the past, but even in the present. And we're gonna look at what do we need to do to move towards what is one of the primary planks of my platform, which is a national dialogue on race, gender, and class, a truth and conciliation commission. So it's gonna be a full day. There's gonna be a lot of content. I'm, we're, we're breaking it up into four parts, so they're in more bite-sized pieces. And, uh, but there's gonna be a lot to digest, a lot to think about. And so I'm very excited to have everybody here. And uh, it looks like we're having a fairly good turnout so far, so I wanna, share my screen on, I have two computers set up here. I wanna share my screen on the second computer um, so that we can begin the process of um, getting this lecture going. So let me just move this here. And there we go. So I have to warn you, over these next uh, total of hopefully two to two and a half hours of speaking and lecturing today, I'm going to say a lot of things that are probably going to offend many of you. I'm going to relay, uh, lay out a history that most of you have never heard. I'm going to talk about things, especially regarding faith and even national identity that are going to feel offensive to many of you, especially those from white European uh, heritage. And I want to encourage you to stay with this. Probably at different points in this lecture, you're gonna to want to either turn off your screen or even throw something towards the screen at me. Resist those urges. Let's stay engaged, let's stay connected. There'll be times to ask questions. You can submit questions in the chat. We'll try to take some time after each lecture to maybe identify one or two questions that we can answer. And definitely as we move forward through the last three weeks of this campaign, we will try to answer as many of the questions that we can that are coming out about this content. But we have to get through this. There's, there's a history in our nation that we don't know how to talk about, we don't know what to do with, and we need to find a way to talk about it. So before I go any further, I wanna acknowledge that I am not the first, nor am I the last person to be writing about the Doctrine of Discovery and speaking about this. In fact, there have been many people 
who have come before me and many who will come after me who will write and have insight and, and do something to move this conversation forward. And one of the people I want to acknowledge is Stephen Newcomb, who's wrote and written a very important book on this topic called Pagans in the Promised Land. Now, Steve and I are not going to agree on everything, but I think his voice is incredibly important. He is a Shawnee man, and I appreciate his research and the, the effort he's put not only into articulating this doctrine of discovery and how he sees it affecting our nation, but also to the, the tremendous effort he's put into bringing this to the forefront, both within the country and even to the Vatican. There are many other people who are working on this doctrine. One of the people I've had I was most uh, thrilled to meet was a woman by the name of Marcella Rebue. And I had the privilege of meeting her a little over a year ago. It was in August of 2019 when I was attending the Frank Lemire Native American Presidential Forum in Iowa. And I was there with 10 of the, of the Democratic candidates and a few Republicans. And I was there as an independent. I was the only Native attending this forum as a candidate. And it was the first real na major native forum for uh, the, the central candidates that our nation's ever had. And it was a very big deal. There was a lot of press, there were a lot of people there. And there was a woman, a 99 year old woman, World War II veteran, served as a nurse, native woman. And she was sitting in the front row and throughout the day throughout the two days of the forum she asked many times the first question she asked about um the the medals of honor given at wounded knee which we'll talk about later this, this in today and she asked several of the candidates and the candidates who were there besides myself were bernie sanders kamala harris Julian castro elizabeth warren there were there were probably Five of the top 10 Democratic candidates were there, and there were others there, like Marianne Williamson and others who were there. And, and she was asking these candidates about the doctrine of discovery, and she was tenacious. I was so appreciative for her words and for her questioning that I actually went up and met her and introduced myself to her. And I got to talk to her personally. And then when I was on stage, I took the first almost 15 minutes of my section because none of the other candidates addressed the doctrine of discovery. They all ignored that part of her questioning. And I took the first 10 to 15 minutes of my session to actually address her directly as the elder in the room and talk to her and answer her questions about the doctrine of discovery. So there are many, many, many people who are bringing this to the forefront and who are working very, very hard. And I want to honor all of them. I want to thank all of them who are bringing this dialogue to the forefront. And I am thrilled to be a part of it and especially to be able to do it through this campaign. So to understand the doctrine of discovery, we have to go back to not only the birth of the church, the Christian church, which started with the teachings of Jesus, but we have to go into an understanding of the nation of Israel and the relationship that they had with the God of Abraham. Because actually there is some, pro some things there that are rooted in that faith and in that history that we need to understand. And one of the things that defined the nation of Israel from all the other nations, if you read the Old Testament of the Bible, is that they had, they believed they had a land covenant with the God of Abraham. This land covenant basically was a, a, a covenant of prosperity. We see it mentioned in Deuteronomy chapter 30, where it says, if we keep his commandments and his ordinances and his laws and the articles of our covenant with him, that we may live and be multiplied and that are, uh, that the Lord our God may bless us in this land. So this passage, Deuteronomy chapter 30, is the people of Israel are literally standing at the banks of the Jordan River. They're about ready to cross over and take possession of their promised lands. And they are reminding themselves, they're being reminded by God, by the prophets of their land covenant that says, if we obey God, we will be blessed and we will prosper in this land. And if we turn away and we worship other gods, we will surely perish out of the good land that we're crossing over this river to take possession of. So what this meant for the people of Israel is that they had a land covenant 
And the land covenant set up a barometer of prosperity. This wasn't the only barometer, it wasn't the only measure, but the people of Israel could generally look at their current circumstances. Were they prospering? Were their borders secure? Were they strong? Were their enemies at bay? Were their crops growing? Were their families healthy? If those things were prospering, there was a good chance they were doing well in their relationship with their God. If they were not prospering, if their borders were weak, if they were being invaded, if they were fighting their enemies, if they were even removed from their lands and in exile, there is a good chance there was a challenge, a problem, something that went wrong in their relationship with their God. They had a barometer. One of their primary barometers of their land covenant was their prosperity. And so when Jesus was born into this world, he was actually coming at a time where the people of Israel were not prospering. They actually were occupied. Now, they were still on what was mostly their promised lands. They still had access to Jerusalem and to the temple, but they were under the oppression of the Roman Empire. Some of them had, had, had intermarried with the Samaritans, and they, and they had... Um, broken the covenant of that they were only supposed to marry Jewish people. And the people of Israel were waiting. They were waiting for a Messiah. They were waiting for someone to come and politically rescue them, to come and reestablish a worldly empire, restoring it, something to the memory of what they saw with the, the kingdom of David, King David, who was seen as one of their greatest kings, who expanded their borders and terrified their enemies and, and defeated their enemies. And his, he and his son ruled for years and years. Very prosperous kingdom, a very strong kingdom, a very mighty kingdom. There were stories and stories and the Psalms written by King David and the Proverbs written by his son Solomon during this kind of golden age of, of the nation of Israel. And so when Jesus was born, the people of Israel were not prospering. They were not strong. They were under the oppression of the Romans. They could not worship freely. They were being taxed. They were being told what to do and where to go. They were under this oppression. And they were waiting for a Messiah to come. Now, Jesus, throughout the Gospels, is identified as coming as the Messiah. He's coming as the Son of Man. He's coming as this, this figure that the people of Israel were waiting for. But he wasn't coming in the way they were expecting. Yes, he was the Messiah, but he was born in a stable. And he grew up in the backwater town of Nazareth. And it was said that nothing good could come out of Nazareth. Yes, he was the Messiah, but he grew up as a refugee in Egypt. Yes, there, there were great things happening. Angels were singing and announcing his birth, but they were singing to shepherds. So you could see, even in the way that the, the Gospels portrayed his coming, he was not coming as this imperial Messiah that the people of Israel were waiting for. He was coming differently. Yes, he was still identifying himself as the Messiah, and the, the Gospel writers were doing the same thing, but it was a different picture than what they were expecting. And in Matthew 4... Satan goes to Jesus, this is before he begins his public ministry, and he takes him out into the wilderness, or he meets Jesus in the wilderness, and he begins to tempt him. And one of the temptations he gives to Jesus is he takes him to the high, the point of this high point, and he shows Jesus the kingdoms of the world and tempts him with what he assumes is the goal, which is earthly kingdom. And says to Jesus, if you bow down to me, I will give you these kingdoms. Now, Jesus walks away. He was not tempted by that. He, he did not give up anything to attain these kingdoms of the world. In Luke 7, John the Baptist, who was one of the, of the, the prophets or the, the, the voices who was trumpeting the coming of Jesus, the birth of this Messiah, he was preparing the people for whatever the Messiah was going to be doing. And he was very excited about Jesus. He identified very early on that he was the one who was coming. And he was talking about him. He was out in the wilderness baptizing people. He was working very hard to lift up the name of Jesus as this Messiah. 
But John the Baptist got arrested and he was in prison. And while he was there, he heard stories about Jesus. And two of the stories he heard was that Jesus was healing the servants of centurion, the Roman centurion. And he was also healing the, the children, actually raising from the dead, the children of widows. Now, this did not jive with his understanding of this military imperial messiah who was coming to save them politically. Why would this messiah be healing the servants of their enemies, the Roman centurions and the Roman soldiers? Why would this messiah be wasting his time helping widows when there was a military victory to be fought and political balance to be restored? And he was so troubled by this that he sent his disciples, remember, he was to go and find Jesus and talk to him. And he said to ask Jesus, are you the one we're looking for, or are we supposed to be waiting for somebody else? Now, I love Jesus' response. He turns around, and he actually heals more people, gives sight to more of the blind, helps more of the poor, right in front of John's disciples. And then he says to them, he says, go back and tell your master what you've seen. And blessed is the man who doesn't fall away on my account. So Jesus hears John's question. He turns around and does more of what John is complaining about. And then basically tells John, this is what I'm doing. This is what I'm about. Either get on board or get out of the way. Jesus is saying, yeah, I'm the Messiah, but I'm doing something different. I'm not going to fill these imperial political expectations that you have for me. In John chapter 6, there's the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000. Now, there's many stories throughout the gospel of, of Jesus feeding large numbers of people. But in John 6, it's interesting because after he does this miracle, steals some kid's lunch, feeds 5,000 people, the, the people are actually very excited. And it says they came by force to make him king. Now, Jesus was already there. He did not come to establish a worldly Christian empire. He was not a political messiah. He was not coming to restore the fortunes of the kingdom of David. He was, he was the messiah, but he was doing something different. And so when the people came to him to make him king by force, he just walked away. Direction. In Mark 8, Jesus is with his disciples and they're, they're having a kind of a personal moment of teaching. He's demonstrated, he's been out, he's been letting them follow him, he's modeled for them what he teaches, they've seen him do miracles, and they're having a discussion, an internal discussion with just Jesus and his apostles. And he says to them, Who do people think I am? And the disciples, Well, some think that you're. Um, Elijah. Some think that you're John the Baptist. And others think that you are one of the Old Testament prophets. These, this is the word on the street. He says, this is, this is what people think of you. They, they think you're one of these Old Testament prophets. You're, you're Elijah, come back. You're John the Baptist, who has now been killed, come back. You are one of the Old Testament prophets who has come back. And again, you, this is who people think you are. He says, well, how about you? my followers, my apostles, who do you think I am? Now, Peter, who is usually the most bold and talks the most quickly, he comes up and he says, you're the Messiah. <clears throat> now, what's very interesting is Jesus doesn't get excited about this. He says, great, you got it, Peter. I'm so excited. This is that. Let's, let's move on. No, he actually tells Peter and the rest of the disciples not to tell anybody. Don't tell anybody. And then he begins to teach them that the Messiah, the Son of Man, must be persecuted and even crucified. Now, this is so counter to what Peter was expecting of his Messiah to be persecuted and crucified that he pulls his own teacher aside and arrogantly begins to rebuke him. No, Jesus, you don't have to die. This isn't what you're, you're the Messiah. You don't need to die. And Jesus, seeing the other disciples watching the spectacle, turns to Peter and rebukes him very 
be strong. He says, get behind me, Satan. You're not on the side of God, but of men. He rebukes his own disciple, literally calls him Satan. After that, Jesus begins teaching them. We see this in the book of Luke. We see in other gospels that not only will he as the Messiah be persecuted and even crucified, but that his disciples will experience the same fate. In Luke 21, he says, they will seize you and persecute you. They will hand you over to synagogues and put you in prison. You will be brought before kings and governors all on account of my name. You will be betrayed even by parents, brothers and sisters, relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. Everyone will hate you because of me. This is not a rosy picture he's painting for his apostles. He says, yes, I'm going to be persecuted. Yes, I'm going to be crucified, but so are you because you're following me. And another point in his message, and we see this in Matthew 5, Jesus actually begins to tweak their understanding of prosperity. In the Sermon on the Mount, he actually says to them that blessed are you when people insult you persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. He said, rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way, they persecute the prophets who are before you. So Jesus is taking their barometer of prosperity that came from their land covenant that said, if they obeyed God, they would prosper. And now he is telling his disciples, you will know you are doing well in your discipleship. You will know you are on the right path. You will know that you are following my teachings correctly, not when you prosper, but when you are persecuted. He's changing the barometer. No more will prosperity be the barometer, the measure of the relationship with God. Now persecution will be their barometer. Well, as we already know, the disciples do not like this idea. When Peter hears of it, he tells Jesus, no, that's not what we're going to do. And if you actually look, if if that interaction he had with Peter in Mark 8 is in the middle of that gospel, it's really in the middle of that story. And the whole second half of the book of Mark is Jesus essentially arguing with his disciples and trying to convince them about this barometer, not of prosperity, but of persecution. You see that in Mark 8, when Peter gets rebuked by Jesus. In Mark 9, there's this interesting interaction where the disciples come to Jesus, and they're pretty proud of themselves because they were out and they saw someone doing the work they've been doing, even doing the work Jesus has been doing, which is casting out demons and healing the sick, preaching in his name. And they, they stopped him because he wasn't a part of their group. And they come up to Jesus and they're excited. They're like, hey, Jesus, guess what? We found this guy doing stuff like what we were doing in your name. And we told him to stop. They were pretty proud of themselves. Jesus says, why would you tell him to stop? Surely anyone who gives you a cup of water in my name will not lose their reward. Why are you telling them to stop? But then he goes on and he warns them. He says, if any of you cause one of these little ones who believes in me to sin, it'd be better if you tied a millstone around your neck and jumped into the ocean. He said, if your hand causes you to think you are better than somebody else, chop it off. For it's better to enter life maimed than with two hands to be thrown into hell. He says, if your eye causes you to believe you're better than someone else, gouge it out. It's better to go into life blind than with two eyes to be thrown into hell. Jesus pulls out his most severe warnings, his most severe rebukes, his most pointed threats. Not when talking with sinners and tax collectors. Not when dealing with Roman soldiers and people who are oppressing him. Not with dealing when dealing with the hypocrisy of the religious rulers, the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the rulers in the temple. Jesus pulls out his most pointed threats when his disciples begin to think that because they are with Jesus, they are somehow better than other people. 
end of Mark, in Mark 14, Jesus is preparing for his own crucifixion. And he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he's about ready to be arrested. And he's modeling for his disciples that because of this barometer of, of persecution, because what the, the path is, is going to be painful and hard and lonely, he models for them that they should be praying. And he models three times going out and praying and pleading with God and ultimately surrendering his will to God. The disciples don't do this. They're, they're, they fall asleep. And so when the persecution comes, when the people come to arrest Jesus, Peter draws a sword, starts cutting off people's ears. Jesus actually heals them, puts the ear back on. And then everybody flees, leaving Jesus alone to submit himself to the arrest and ultimately to crucifixion. When he was before Pilate, Pilate did not want to crucify Jesus. He was politically stuck. Jesus had done nothing wrong that he could find. He was not a threat. Yes, he was causing some theological turmoil within the Jewish community. He was not a threat to the Romans. And he didn't want to crucify him. And he was asking Jesus questions, trying to find a way to let him off. And Jesus wasn't answering him. And Jesus said, he said to him, don't you know I have the power to kill you or set you free? Answer my questions. And Jesus kind of scoffs and says, you don't have any authority over me. The only authority you have is what my father has. He said, my kingdom's not of this world. If it were my servants, the angels would come and prevent my arrest. He says, no, my kingdom is from somewhere else. Jesus was adamant throughout his entire ministry. He did not come as a political messiah. He did not come to establish a Christian empire. He did not come to create some worldly Christian kingdom. Everything he was talking about was somewhere else, was not in this physical world. He was absolutely adamant, even to his own death. He was convinced of this. And he said it over and over and over again. The disciples didn't actually get it. Again, Jesus died alone. And even after the stories of his resurrection, he appeared to his disciples, but they still didn't believe him. They went back to their old jobs. They went back to fishing. They went back to their old work. It wasn't until Pentecost in the book of Acts where the disciples <clears throat> excuse me, finally got it. They finally understood this barometer of prosperity was gone and that their new barometer of their measure of their faith of their obedience of their walk with god was not their prosperity but instead their persecution and beginning with the with pentecost and the healing of people they began to be persecuted and in fact most of the apostles it's believed went on to die a martyr's death they embrace this barometer that Jesus modeled for them and taught them and showed them. They gave up this picture of an earthly kingdom and they began working for something else. And most of them were martyred and persecuted and killed. So in the first through third century, this is what defined the church. This small band of loosely <laughs> connected people who they joined this church through their discipleship, through their baptism, through their confession, and through their community. And this community was marked, not by prosperity, but by persecution. And the church was actively and even brutally persecuted from the first through the third centuries. Now in the fourth century, we have the rise of what is known as, it's actually a heretical teaching known as Christendom, Christian empire. And for many years, most of my life, I blamed Christendom, this heresy of a mixing between empire and church on Constantine, right? He was the emperor who converted to Christianity and he, he moved the capital of the church and he Christianized Rome. 
after his kingdom, the, the, he completely redefined what it meant to be the church. Now, instead of joining the church through your baptism and your discipleship, your confession, your community, now you join the church. You were a member of the church simply because you were a citizen of the empire, the Roman Empire. Completely, fundamentally shifted what it meant to be the church. When we were writing our book on selling truths, we had a story that we began the book with. It was a story from my life, something I even don't know now what it was, but it was a story I, I had told many times. And as we were reading it, looking at it in the first chapter of the book, we realized that the way I was telling it as a Native man was not the way most people who weren't Native were hearing it. And we decided to change the story. And we wanted to include the story instead of Constantine's vision of Jesus at Melvin, Melvin Bridge where Constantine claimed he saw a vision of Jesus who told him to go out and conquer under the symbol of a cross. And we wanted to include that story. Now, <laughs> I had never studied that story in depth. I knew it existed, I knew it was there, but I never looked at it historically. And so I decided to, to research it. I found the story was recorded by an author, actually the Bishop of Caesarea named Eusebius. And it was included not in his primary book, which was Ecclesiastical History, but in his second book, um, which is The Life of the Blessed Constantine. And so it led me to look more closely at the writings of Eusebius. Now, Eusebius was, he was the Bishop of Caesarea. He lived right around the, the turn of the century, around the fourth century. And his book, Ecclesiastical History, was an attempt to capture the historical narrative of the church. There, there had not been a formal organized church really well established before then, and he attempted to re record the history of the church from Jesus up until the fourth century. His book actually began before Jesus was born with the persecution and the, and the killing of, of, of the babies when Jesus was born. It didn't go into depth into his life, and then it picked up with the stoning of Stephen and the martyrs of the church all the way up through the fourth century. His book is actually a volume of 11 books. And around book eight, we see something, and it's about this book, especially early on. He establishes the divinity of Christ. And he establishes the persecution of the church. And he holds the martyrs up in great esteem. These are people who are dying for their faith. He, he holds them up as, as tremendous examples and models for the church. And then in the eighth book, he introduces this character named Constantius, who is Constantine's father. And he identifies him as a blessed man, which is striking because up until that point, it was all the Roman empires who were literally persecuting the church. And now we see a, a blessed emperor of, of the empire. And then he refers to his son Constantine. And he refers to Constantine as a God-ordained ruler of this empire. Again, which is striking because up until now, all of the, even, well, all of the emperors were persecuting the church. Now, between books eight and nine, he inserts a book. It's called the Book of the Martyrs. And this book is about what's known as the Great Persecution, which happened around 303 AD. It's actually a like brutal, brutal persecution. And in this book, this Book of the Martyrs, part of this volume, Eusebius records that not only did he observe and get touched by this persecution, saying that he knew some of the people who were martyred personally and saw some of their deaths with his own eyes. So this persecution touches him. He didn't die, but his relationships are now in danger. They're under threat. His own safety is now in question. And it's after the Book of the Martyrs that we see there's a strikingly different tone in his writing about this history. And now, instead of focusing on the piety and the, and the, 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 the beauty of, of the martyrs and what they were doing and what they were dying for, now he's focusing on the emperors and what they can do to end this persecution. And he begins propping up Constantine as a God-ordained emperor of Rome. Now, what's striking is 
Eusebius and Constantine didn't even meet until um, after the Battle of Melvane Bridge. I'm not going to go fully into depth to that. <laughs> like I said, there's so much information here. There's some, well, I will. Because in this vision, right, Eusebius, our Constantine actually doesn't report this vision until years after the battle happened. This is why it's not recorded in ecclesiastical history. It's recorded in Eusebius's next book, The Life of the Blessed Constantine. Because they didn't actually meet until, um, I think it's the Council of Nicaea, which was called by Constantine. And the Battle of Melvane Bridge took place much earlier. And after the Battle of Melvane Bridge, both Eusebius and other architects and writers began propping up Constantine as the God-ordained emperor of Rome. They had their own political agendas they were trying to accomplish. And Constantine is definitely hearing these things going on. And so later when he meets Eusebius, he tells him the story of this vision that he reported to have seen years earlier at Melvane Bridge. And the story, this, this vision is that Jesus appeared to him and showed him the form of a cross and told him to go out and conquer under this form, which is what he said gave him the ability to win this battle at Melvane Bridge and unify Rome. Now, there's actually another story of Jesus appearing to someone and giving him a vision after his resurrection, and that's the story of St. Paul. When Paul, back then known as Saul, was persecuting the church, he was on his way to Damascus to persecute the believers there, and he was stopped, and actually he reported to have seen a vision of Jesus. And this vision was so vivid it blinded him and he had to be led into Damascus, and he sat there blind for three days. Then the Spirit of God is reported to have appeared to a man named Ananias, and the Spirit said, go to Saul and tell him how he must now suffer on account of my name. I am calling him to be a, a, a voice to preach to the Gentiles. And it said to tell him how much he must suffer on account of my name. Now, why would the Spirit say that? Was he trying to punish Saul for wanting to persecute the church? No. Right? If this was Jesus, what was his barometer of good discipleship? What was he telling all of his apostles would happen to him if they followed him? That they would prosper? that their, their victories would be secured, or that they would be persecuted. Clearly, it was persecution. This is what Jesus said over and over and over to his apostles. Why would the calling of Saul, if it was done by the Spirit of God, be any different? So he actually told Ananias to tell Saul, who became Paul, how much he must suffer because he was going to follow Jesus. So I don't know who... Constantine saw a vision of, or even if he saw one. But I promise you, I guarantee you, it was not a vision of Jesus. Right? Jesus would never appear to the emperor of the most powerful empire in the nation and give him the form of a cross and tell him to conquer underneath it. Never happened. If you know anything about the teachings of Jesus, anything about his barometer, what he came to do, that would never happen. That was a blatant, flat-out lie. But again, Constantine was, Eusebius was, was trying to end the persecution, and he was propping up Constantine as this God-ordained emperor of Rome, and Constantine bit. He became a Christian. He Christianized Rome. He made this Christian empire, completely changing what it meant to be the church. And now he was the Christian empire of this Christian nation, the Christian emperor of this Christian nation, this Christian empire. Now, if you're writing a book called Ecclesiastical History, which is what Eusebius was doing, this was in the, in the fourth century, your book technically, if you understand what was taught about the church, wouldn't have an ending, it wouldn't have a conclusion. 
Jesus said throughout his teachings that he, he called himself the bridegroom and he called the church his bride. And he said that he would return one day for his bride. So if you're writing a book called Ecclesiastical History, the history of the church, meaning that your bridegroom has not returned yet, meaning the history, the historical account of this church is not over, Therefore, your book cannot have a conclusion because it's merely a chapter in this longer historical saga that is still ongoing. But if we read the final chapter of the final volume of, Ecclesi of, of Eusebius's account of ecclesiastical history, you will see he absolutely does have a conclusion. The final chapter is called The Victory of Constantine and the Blessings Under Him Accrued to the Whole Roman World. At the same time, they celebrated and extolled, first of all, all God, the universal king, because thus they were taught. Then they also celebrated the praise of the pious emperor and with him all his divinely favored children. The supreme God granted from heaven above the fruits of his piety, the trophies of victory over the wicked and that nefarious tyrant with all his counselors and adherents, he cast prostrate, not at the feet of Christ, but of Constantine. According to Eusebius, the conclusion of ecclesiastical history is not the salvation that comes through Jesus, but the salvation that comes to Rome through Constantine. See, if you want to prop up a Roman Empire, an earthly emperor, as the God-ordained ruler of a Christian nation, a Christian empire, if you want to create a heresy known as Christendom, a teaching Jesus was adamantly opposed to and had nothing to do with, the first thing you have to do is you have to write Christ out of ecclesiastical history, which is exactly what Eusebius does. His conclusion is that the salvation that comes to Rome is not about Christ, it's about Constantine. And then his second book is just flat out heresy, The Life of the Blessed Emperor Constantine. Chapter 4 was titled, How God Honored Constantine. Chapter 6 was titled, He was the Servant of God and the Conqueror of Nations. Chapter 8 was titled, He Conquered Nearly the Whole World. What did Satan promise Jesus if he would give up, if he would bow down to him? The kingdoms of the world. Chapter 28 was titled, While He Was Praying, God Sent Him a Vision of a Cross at, of Light in the Heavens at Midday with an inscription, admonishing Him to conquer by that. And chapter 29 was titled, How the Christ of God Appeared to Him in His Sleep and Commanded Him to Use in His Wars a Standard Made in the Form of a Cross. Again, I don't know who appeared to Constantine. I don't know who his vision was of, but I promise you, it was not of Jesus. So this creates the heresy of Christendom, Christian empire, which has nothing to do with the teachings of Jesus. In fact, it writes out of ecclesiastical history and inserts Constantine, and inserts the emperor. So in the fifth century, the people of the day have to wrestle with this. The theologians have to wrestle. What do they do with this heresy? Do they prophesy to it and rebuke it, or do they collude with it and try to bring it about? Augustine is one of the first theologians after Constantine's empire. And he develops, St. Augustine develops what's known as the just war theory. Now the just war theory has two purposes. To call nations to fight wars more justly and to justify how Christian citizens of a Christian empire can go off and kill in the name of God and country. I use the fact that he developed the just war theory as proof that Augustine was working to collude with this heresy rather than prophesy to it. But I want to find where he crossed the line, right? Where did he go over the edge? Because whenever you go over the edge of Jesus, he would reject the same person. He kicked out of the church, but he was called Satan, corrected. So I was looking through, where does Augustine go over the line? I read through his writings on just war. I looked at his writings on the two kingdoms. I couldn't seem to find it there. But I was looking through some writings he did on the book, The Corrections of the Donatists. The Donatists were a group that was teaching heresy. They were kind of a thorn in Augustine's side most of his life. And in chapter five, he's asking, actually not a bad question. 
what's the role of a Christian king in a Christian empire? They've never had this before. They've always been a oppressed group of people within a secular empire. And now he's saying, now that we have a Christian empire and a Christian king, what's the role? And he concludes that the role is to prevent and chastise with religious severity all those acts which are done in opposition to the commands of the Lord. He says the Christian king in the Christian empire serves the Lord by embracing with suitable rigor such laws as ordain what is righteous and punishes what is the reverse. In chapter 6, he says it's indeed better that men should be driven to fear, should be driven to it, the teachings of God by fear of punishment or pain. But it does not follow that because the former cause produces the better man, therefore they would do not yield to it should be neglected. For many have found advantage, he wrote, in first being compelled by fear or pain, so that they might afterwards be influenced by sound teaching. So St. Augustine is arguing the role of the Christian king in the Christian empire is to compel people through fear, punishment, and pain to obey the teachings of Jesus and to keep the commandment of the church. This has nothing to do with what Jesus taught, nothing to do with what he modeled. This is complete and utter heresy. This teaching, of course, shapes and molds into what are called the Crusades, which is about expanding the Christian empire, as well as protecting Jerusalem. That goes on through the 11th, 12th century. In the 13th century, we have Thomas Aquinas, who's writing, he's another theologian. He's also dealing with the heretics people teaching falsehood. And he says that it's a much graver matter that if, basically he argues that if, if the secular authorities have the right to kill people who break men's laws, how much more right does the church have to kill people who break God's laws? He says it's a much graver matter to corrupt the faith which quickens the soul than to forge money which supports temporal life. Wherefore, if forges of money and other evildoers are forthwith condemned to death by the secular authority, how much more reason is there for heretics, as soon as they are convicted of heresy, to not only be excommunicated, but even put to death? So he's arguing that the role of the Christian king in the Christian empire is to kill people who don't keep the commands of the church. About that same time, the church introduces a new word into its vocabulary. It's known as the infidel. It's a subhuman category. It's used in reference to the Moors, to other indigenous peoples, anyone who doesn't worship the God of the white European Christian male. Now that we have this subcategory of infidels, now this changes the justification for wars. Now you can do wars based on your theological grounds. You're fighting the other. You're fighting the enemies of Christ. So it's out of this that in 1452, Pope Nicholas V writes these words, invade, search out, capture, vanquish, and subdue all Saracens and pagans whatsoever. Reduce their persons to perpetual slavery, convert them to his and to their use and profit. This papal bull, along with other papal bulls written between 1452 and 1493, collectively become known as what we call the Doctrine of Discovery. The Doctrine of Discovery it's essentially the church in Europe saying to the nations of Europe, wherever you go, whatever lands you find not ruled by white European Christian rulers, those people are subhuman and their land is yours for the taking. This is literally the doctrine that let European nations go into Africa, colonize the people and enslave them because they did not believe they were human. It's the same doctrine that let Columbus, who was lost at sea, land in this new world, which was already inhabited by million and claimed to have discovered it. You cannot discover lands already inhabited. The fact that we have proclamations and statutes and monuments and even days honoring Columbus as the discoverer of America reveals the implicit racial bias of our nation, which is that native peoples in general, are in specific, and people of color in general are not fully human. The doctrine of discovery is a white male Christian supremacist doctrine that is the direct fruit of a church that has 
prostituted itself out to the empire. And this is why, as Americans, regardless of the faith that you follow, regardless of the beliefs that you hold, regardless of your background, if you are an American citizen, you need to understand the history of the church because it absolutely shaped this doctrine, which we will see in our next lectures, has been embedded into the foundations of our country and even become the legal precedent land titles. This is not just a Christian issue. If you are an American, this heresy of the church, which perverted the teachings of Jesus, created this heresy known as Christendom, Christian empire, has shaped your life today. In our next lecture, which we're going to begin at noon the time, we're going to look at the doctrine of discovery, how it's been embedded into the foundations of our country, and how it being embedded has had devastated consequences, devastating consequences on our history, especially on our treatment of indigenous peoples, of African people, and of other people of color. I know this was a lot. We went a bit longer than we thought. We've actually been going for about an hour, but I really thank everybody for sticking with this. We seem to have a fairly consistent group uh, throughout this, and we will be doing more of this Q&A, or more of this lecture throughout the day. If you have questions, I encourage you to put them into the chat, and we will go through the chat and bring out the questions that we can find um, and try to answer them, if not today, in the coming days and weeks. Um, if you also want to go to our website at markcharles2020.com and uh, you can um, click on Q&A and you can submit your questions there uh, and we'd be happy to try to answer them. So um, also we're doing this as a, as a way to teach this history, as a way to help our nation find a way to move forward. But we have to get through this understanding of this history first. And, and this is just the first part. This is just how we got from the teachings of Jesus to the writing of this doctrine of discovery. And throughout the rest of the day, we're going to look at even some of its more impacts and understandings. I shout out my relatives. I appreciate you joining me today. Walk in beauty. And then we learn how to walk in beauty together. <laughs>